Hi, this is Chef Rick Moonen interviewing from my studio in Las Vegas. The name of my podcast is Ocean Raised. Here's where I get to dive deep into storytelling with the original gangsters of cuisine to find out where they started and what drives them. Today, I connect with a chef with a purpose. From his upbringings in the Appalachian Mountains of West Virginia, Chef William Disson always has been in touch with the outdoors and nature, spending time on his grandparents' farm, watching his grandmother cook bountiful meals straight from the garden in the kitchen table has been a major influence on his style of cooking, as well as his beliefs in sustainable agriculture and local cuisine. After graduating from West Virginia University, studying English and French, Chef Disson had bigger aspirations to work for the, in the culinary arts. Studies of French language and culture led him towards the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York. While honing in his skills under the, our country's prominent uh, chef instructors, Chef Disson graduated with honors and was ready to begin his career as an inspiring chef. From the CIA, he left for the Greenbrier Resort in West Virginia to work with under certified master chef Peter Timmons and uh, his renowned culinary apprenticeship program. Uh, moving on to the low country of Charleston, South Carolina, uh, chef, Dis D chef Disson was introduced to another uh, native West Virginian, Donald uh, uh, Brickman, owner and chef of uh, Magnolia's, a very well-known restaurant. It was uh, there in Charleston that uh, Chef Disson worked in his, in his fine dining establishment, uh, Cypress, to truly hone his culinary skills. After sharpening his skills in the low country, William continued his education by attending a master's degree of hospitality. Uh, restaurant and Tourism Management at the University of South Carolina. It was at this time that he began his dream of opening his own restaurant at the mountains and fields of Appalachia. It began to call home to him. Here in Asheville, William found the renowned Marketplace Restaurant on historic Wall Street to call home. At his restaurants, the Marketplace in Asheville, North Carolina, Haymaker Restaurant in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Billy D's Fried Chicken in North Carolina Zoo in Ash Asheboro, North Carolina, Disson works with a network of local farms, artisans, producers, sustainable fishermen to produce flavorful, fresh food for his patrons. Um, he is honored as a rising star uh, by uh, Chef by uh, Star Chef magazine. Uh, he was also named 40 Chefs Under 40 for his innovative approach to sustainable cuisine and was awarded the Seafood Watch Ambassador by the Monterey Bay Aquarium and again was honored as a member of their elite group of chefs of which I'm a member, to the Blue Ribbon Task Force for his use of sustainable seafood. He was also chosen as a Green Chef of the Year by Fortune Magazine 2012 and 2013. He was selected as a member of the nationally acclaimed James Beard Foundation Chef Boot Camp in 2013 and 19, and was hosted and, and participated in over 14 James Beard Foundation dinners. <sighs> okay, a little bit more, we're going. Disson is also a member of the U.S. State Department's American Chefs Corp, where he works domestically and abroad to bring culinary diplomacy to the table. He recently spent time at the United Nations to update their global food policy by way of the United Nations Chefs Manifesto to help find solutions for global chain, uh, supply chain issues, food waste, and access to food. William travels globally to address uh, foreign governments and organizations on the importance of a better global food policy for a better world. When William is not behind the stoves in his kitchens, you can find him spending time with his family, enjoying nature in the Blue Ridge Mountains, and working on food policy issues in his local communities or on Capitol Hill, helping to make change through food. I, I can't possibly thank you too much. You know, you, you recognize, uh, your, your recognitions and accolades just go on and on, but you have a very rich culinary backstory that started at a young age and. That is what I want to ha have you tell us about today. So, William, thank you so much. Welcome to our podcast today. Thanks, Chef. Excited to catch up with you. It's been a while. Always excited to uh, catch up and hear what's going on in your world and uh, talk a little bit about what we've been up to here in North Carolina. Yeah, man. So, what's, uh, what's been happening in Vegas? Las Vegas is uh, slowly coming back. You know, places the uh, lights are going back on, occupancy is being increased, and uh, we're still doing things a little carefully. I think in April though, I just read today, April 5th, uh, I'm not sure when this is gonna be airing, but uh, anybody who, um, uh, over 16 is gonna be able to have a vaccine available to them. So that's gonna change everything. So we are very optimistic now as, 
as we should be. And as an environmentalist, I'm, I'm, I'm excited that the, 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 we got a little bit of a break on our environment. And I, and I know there's going to be some sort of a healthy rebound. And if we do this right, we actually have a huge opportunity to do things right. So anyway, um, I'm jumping the gun as I, I can't help myself. Let's um, let's start with the beginning. You know, you were, where, where you were born. How many how many in your family? What was it like yeah. growing up? And where did how did you get involved in food and get serious? You know, so I grew up in Charleston, West Virginia, um, it's the capital of West Virginia, small city, small state. Um, my mother was uh, the son of farmer or the daughter of farmer, excuse me, and my dad uh, was the son of a immigrant steel workers in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, so I grew up with their baby boomer generation that, you know, TV dinners and cooking for a, a family of three with two working parents. You know, we, my mother was a great cook, but it was not, we didn't have fine dining at our home. Um, my family in Pittsburgh was very blue collar, steel workers, Irish, German immigrants. Um, and they cooked good food, but it was, uh, it, it was kind of an afterthought, I think with that generation. Um, on my mother's side though, the daughter of farmers, whenever we go to visit her family, you know, they were, they were folks that lived off the land, right? And they did it not because it was the Brooklyn hipster DIY trend of the moment. They did it because that's how they sustained themselves throughout the year. Right. So at a young age, I got introduced to foraging. I got introduced to growing a garden, uh, preservation, you know, canning, pickling, um, fermenting, curing, all mm -hmm. these things that, you know, I thought my family were just crazy rednecks in the mountains in West Virginia. Um, fast forward to becoming a chef. It's like, those are the, those are the hot trends and, and flavor profiles that chefs are trying to put on their menus. So, um, and I think that's also part of the heritage of West Virginia, right? It's kind of this area that's always been, it's kind of engulfed in mountains, right? And a lot of times the people and the culture is forgotten about, but the food culture has really resonated and kind of grown throughout the years there. And that's something that fast forward as I, you know, became a chef and restaurateur that. I wanted to be able to tell that I want to tell the story of my food and that heritage has been really important to me to be able to try to really resonate that story of where I'm from through the, the preservation techniques and the cookery techniques to put the food on the plate. It's awesome, man. I want to read something about your, it's kind of, I guess it's your mantra. <clears throat> no, we believe in the importance of working locally, not just using ingredients from our surrounding area, but also in our uh, contribution to our community. The success of our restaurant has always been closely entwined with the health and pro uh, the, the health and progress of our community. For over 40 years, we have supported the arts, local needs, and education programs. Our consumers have returned over the decades. We hope, in part, because we have always tried to treat them as family and friends. That is, um, that is like it should be the definition of everybody's approach to hospitality. Right? So. Um, how did you how did you uh, end up with such integrity how did, okay take me further okay you, you, we got you as a on um, we got you between philadelphia and, and a small uh, uh, town in not a small town the biggest town in west virginia which is small you know my uh <laughs> diplomacy right my dad's an attorney so i learned how to bullshit at an early age that boy um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know hospitality i think you know, a lot of it I really kind of learned growing up. But when I was 15 years old, um, I wanted to make extra money. And so I ended up getting a job washing dishes uh, at a local country club. And probably like most other chef stories, somebody called out or didn't show up to work. And they said, hey, we need you on Garde Manger. Do you know how to make salads and sandwiches? And I said, oh, yeah, I can make a sandwich. I can make a salad. Um, that was that, you know. Uh, I think you catch the fever of the kitchen and the uh the energy and the chaos and the camaraderie uh, yeah all that stuff man and it um that was it i i got the bug at early age and you know i, I fortunate to educate myself a lot throughout my career but i always worked in restaurants to support myself and really i i just love the community of it i love the i love the people you meet all walks of life all you know male female um you know all colors and creeds and ethnicities and everyone's got a different opinion oh, yeah. and it's wonderful and it really kind of shaped me you know I, being from west virginia i think it's a wonderful culture and heritage but there's a lot of blinders on right because you're stuck within this rural area so it's kind of one way of thinking and as i got into the restaurant world and started to move out of the state it was just like 
there's this whole big world out there and um, all these people you're meeting, all these different, their heritage and where they're from and the food they brought with them from their other parts of the country, other parts of the world. I, you know, I was just curious, right? I wanted to learn. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's- Stay hungry, my one, son. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, I think that's the, the thing that we all as chefs really get into is that we are hungry, but we, I, I really geek out on that knowledge because I want to learn about why somebody does something, how it works, what makes it work, and why is it delicious? You know, what are those flavor profiles that you can put together that make delicious food in the plate and make people's heads explode at the table? You want to know um, the backstory is so important. I, I agree. I mean, during the pandemic, I've, I've, I've done everything I can to do the things that I, I didn't feel that I didn't have the time to do. You say pickling, I'm fermenting, I'm distilling, I'm uh, growing chicken coops. Now I got eggs every day that I, I got more eggs I can eat, you know, and uh, it's been it's been an incredible journey for me, you know, and I'm, and I'm talking about harvesting whole animals and, and from head to tail doing everything and making sure that the only thing left over you can hold in two hands and everything else is being cooked, eaten or appreciated, you know, and it's it's been really cool for me. And, and, and that's what you you epitomize to me, you know, is that, that that connectiveness. So just just to entertain me, give, give me a. Um, a verbal quick rundown of where you worked and to get to uh, opening your own restaurant. Sure. So, um, so after doing an undergrad at West Virginia university, I was studying English and French there. Um, actually started out college. I had a biology degree to go to Xavier university in Cincinnati and I was supposed to go be a radiologist or some shit like that. And uh, the race riots were going on in Cincinnati and I was like, you know, I think I'm going to move home. And I, my parents kept saying, you just need the piece of paper, get the damn degree. And I always had a knack for language. And so I said, look, I'm going to study English and French. What the hell are you going to do with that? You're going to go to law school. You're going to become a teacher or, yeah, I don't know, work in the languages somewhere. <laughs> uh, but as I was studying French, I started having these, you know, these French study groups. And uh, the French people would bring along baguettes and cheese and bo bottles of red wine and, and all these things. I'm thinking, ah, oh, damn, this is... I like French. This is great. <laughs> and I started, <laughs> well, then I started studying the culture and I had the chance to go to France and like that, that just really consumed me about their culture and how food was part of it. You know, yes. I think in America, we, a lot of times we think it's food as an afterthought. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And there, like, they wake up. Kitchens, you know? Yeah. Well, for there, they, you know, just the every man in France, they wake up thinking about what their meal is going to be, mm -hmm. not because they're a glutton or obese, but because, that's just part of their culture. Mm -hmm. And that really imprinted on me. And you get to the point in life when you're, you know, early twenties and everyone's saying, well, what are you going to do with your life? What are you going to make of yourself, son? Um, I'm thinking, shit, I don't want to go to law school. I don't want to go become a businessman. I want to, you know, I want to create something with my hands. I want to cook. Uh, at the time I used to play tons of sports and run around nonstop. And just the thought of sitting behind a desk sounded, uh, sounded insane. And I started looking at culinary schools, actually applied to L'Ecole Culinaire de Lyon, uh, Paul Bocuse school in Lyon, France. And I was one of the first Americans they accepted. Uh, but this was before Food Network had popped off. And so I, you know, they said, well, we don't have financial aid for Americans. Uh, let us know if you can figure the money out. I think okay. for the, it was going to cost like 90 grand for two years of school uh, without cost of living. And I went to all these banks and I said, hey, uh, can you give me a loan for culinary school? I got laughed out of five banks and told son, just go to law school, you know, make something yourself. Um, so I, you know, the next best thing, right. Tongue in cheek here, but I applied to the culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York. Hey, hey, next best thing. What do you mean? Uh, I mean, it's okay. You know, it's all right. <laughs> um, <laughs> excellent school. So I got accepted there, actually moved to New York two weeks after nine 11, which was pretty crazy. Yeah, um, I'd say so. Um, but started my journey, you know, really down my path of culinary studies and it um my undergrad i had a really good time studying and working and uh, you know chasing girls around and having a good time uh, when i got to culinary school it was like i had found my calling and it just it was like these are my people this is this is it and it just i soaked everything in and yeah, fifth gear pedal to the floor uh ci really changed my life it also helped because i was you know, like I think a lot of young men, I was very brash and very, uh, you know, I, 
bad attitude, right? And, you know, the, I think at the time when I was at CIA, there were 13 master chefs teaching there. They didn't put up with any shit, let me tell you. You know, you show up class a minute late, you're gone for the day. You know, you've got this stubble I've got on my chin here, out of here. Sideburns too long, out of here. Knife's not sharp, out of here. And it was like, wow, like these guys are not screwing around. Like they, this is a trade and I need to, I need to take it as such. And it really created this, this sense of mise en place for me, right? You know, the, everything in its place, but really that mental mise en place of like, I need to have my shit together and everything in order because with, if I don't have my head together, how can I do my job well? How can I be the master of my domain? Hail Mary, I agree. And it really, it really changed the way I, I looked at things. And don't get me wrong, I, you know, was a young man and you know, aspiring chefs. I had a hell of a time living in New York, um, <laughs> but I also worked my ass off. Um, Who, where'd I, you work uh, in New York? So I worked part time uh, with Edward Leonard at the Westchester Country Club. Mm-hmm. Um, when, and that's why I did mostly there. I was also um, uh, also worked uh, in some of the restaurants there. Uh, you know, Ken Arnone. Uh, he was a CMC and instructor there. He ran the Caterina Demici restaurant. Okay, so I worked yeah. with him some. I do. Um, and I drank, the, you know, I was drinking the CIA Kool Aid. They said, you know, if you want to be the best chef, you know, follow the ACF route and go down, you know, Master Chef and all that. I was like, oh, I can do it. Uh, I didn't do it. And so actually I left there and they said, you know, if you want to take your CIA degree to the next level, you need to go to the Greenbrier and go apprentice. That's uh, a good move, I think. Yeah, you know, it's my home state. So, um, so I thought, well, you know, I'll go check it out. And I got into the program at the time. It was a, it was very difficult to get into and they accepted me and it was, you know, it was amazing, but it was like, well, I tell a lot of young cooks that work for me now, they said, you know, chef, I'm finishing culinary school. What do you think I should do? And I tell them, I said, you know, depends on what you want to do. If you want to be a restaurant chef or a hotel chef, I say, go work in a hotel and get your reps up. Right. If you work in one, one of my restaurants, we're, you know, pre COVID at least very busy restaurants, but you may cook 300 steaks in a week. When I was at the Greenbrier, you may cook 300 steaks in a night. Yeah. Um, you know, you're, you're tourneying potatoes, you're peeling baby carrots. God, I, mean, I had experience there where I had, I had uh, peeled and trimmed uh, two bushels of baby carrots for what they called their gold plate dinner. And the uh, um, chef de partie came by and looked at my baby carrots and he looked at the, the stem and there was dirt around it, around the top where the carrot met the stem. Right. He said, chef, these are not finished. Go back and clean them all. Oh, man. And so got my tournay knife and went through and cleaned them all. I think my <laughs> hands were stained orange for a week after that. Your hands but will you know cramp up when you get my age, by the way, because you know, I'll be tornaying something now and also my thumb goes into a cramp. It's, you're gonna, right. it's coming up. Watch out. But, you know, you, you, you get into that mode where, like, as a young chef, I could then do it on autopilot, right? Because you, you've done it so many times. Exactly. And so that, that was I, – I ended up staying for about a year and a half there and then moved to Charleston, South Carolina. Um, I'd gone to visit and was just like, wow, this place is amazing. Uh, beautiful women everywhere. There's beaches. Food is great. It's a burgeoning food scene. I went down there and had a really great time. Um, ran a restaurant called Cypress for a little while. I think at that point, you know, I was mid twenties and I had been working, you know, working in restaurants for 10 years, um, but still obviously young and energetic, but I thought, you know, is this really what I want to do with my life? You know, all these other people are telling me, oh, you know, you're going to be a chef. Are you, how are you going to make yourself? How are you going to make money? You know, this is the, you're in the arts. We didn't care. Uh, I, I didn't. I, I don't know. I, I didn't, and I didn't either. I told them all to go to hell. Um, <laughs> I don't know if a lot of people in my family or, or friend circle like that too much, but it, um, but I was doing what I loved, but I also was trying to figure out, you know, when you, you're at that point, you're a sous chef somewhere and you're working 80 hours a week, no. um, you know, show up to work early, stay late. And I was doing, it was just hitting burnout. And so I thought, man, I'm going to go back and get a, a master's degree and try to get a corporate job or an R and D job or something. Um, and so I moved to Columbia, South Carolina, started University of South Carolina for a master's degree in hospitality and tourism management and taught culinary arts at the university and was a chef at a small restaurant in Columbia and uh, working on a master's degree. And 
that was really amazing for me too to learn the uh, to learn the financial aspect and the marketing aspect and the entrepreneurial aspect of food. Um, I think you know I, I know in, in your career and mine we've met people that are extraordinarily more talented than, than you know our forces combined, right? Out of their pinky finger, but so. can they can they manage a restaurant? Do they understand food cost and labor cost and prime cost and and I, I didn't at the time. And that was really helpful to me to like really get that grasp. Um, and then as I was trying to figure out my path, I was like, you know, I don't know if I can do the corporate world. Um, if I'm going to, this is my career path. I need to be an entrepreneur. And I started looking at restaurants, um, real estate. And, uh, you know, Asheville at the time was like this kind of slightly burgeoning tourist destination you know people went there um in october to go see the leaves change color or to go to the grove park inn which is you know one of america's grand resorts or, or drive the blue ridge parkway but it was kind of a sleepy little appalachian town with a really good farming scene um, and i thought you know i'm done with the big city life um traveling two hours to go outside and play and yeah i found Asheville and um end up buying the marketplace restaurant on its 30th anniversary. So a guy named Mark Rosenstein had founded it 30 years before and he was ready to retire. And, you know, he'd really pushed the farm to table movement on the East coast. You know, I think he opened like five years after Chez Panisse um, and really pushed that, but was very fine dining, white tablecloth, chamber yeah. music. And, and, Ash, know, and Ash, you know, Asheville right now is a <clears throat> uh, foodies must go to place. It's really a foodie town, and you've been a big driving part of that. And certainly, it's super cool. I, you know, and I um, embarrassingly have not had the chance to go yet, but I am close enough by because uh, I, I end up in uh, Raleigh a lot. You know? Okay. And so, and my son's uh, going to be moving to Winston. So, I, you know, oh, I'm nice. Gonna, so, I, I have to make a trek out and see you. I mean, it's been too long. Oh, my gosh. I don't know, less and you got to come, uh, come out next month and go foraging for ramps. Oh man, don't tell me. When they hit, they would the old timers say tax day is ramp day. Yeah, you know, I never I never foraged ramps. I found ramps, you know, and you, you cut them off. But I never said, okay, today we're going after ramps on at the perfect time. I would that would be a, a trip, just a sensory experience so it just embeds itself in your in in your head. That's why I did during the pandemic last year, right after we'd shut down, I was just you know, brain melt thinking, Oh my god, I'm gonna lose all my restaurants and going bankrupt. <laughs> what the hell's gonna happen? And um, I think to my wife's dismay, I was like, I'm leaving for a day or two days. I'm just going to go out in the woods. And it was probably the most therapeutic thing for me just mm -hmm. to get lost in the woods by myself, be on top of a mountain, hands in the dirt, pulling some ramps out the, out of the ground. Um, just, you know, it's, it's nice to hit the reset. You know, nature, nature is good for that kind of therapy. So you, you, you brought all of that. You're, it, and that's a rich and very cool background you have. So you bring it all into the marketplace and making sure that you've got enough of a rounded education, you can actually turn it into a business. Understand the moves that have to happen in the business. There's a lot of variables. I mean, I, you know, I, I, start, I bought the marketplace September 1st of 2009 mm -hmm. and the market was trending down, but it, that winter, it, you know, it was the worst business move I ever made because that was that winter it snowed every weekend uh anywhere from three to 12 inches um and it would literally be me in a dishwasher in the kitchen cooking for five to ten people and i'm going yeah. oh my no, god I've seen, I've seen that when i was in vermont i'd see those days yeah the mud season <laughs> when you yeah. think what the hell what the hell have i done but you know resilience right that's what you know the the pandemic has been insane but i look back at that time it's like you know I don't want to work that hard again, but I have it in me and, you know, I'm resilient. I have the, the power to figure this out. Um, yeah, that's, that's the sign of a successful chef during this time, you know, you would be like the roly polies you know, ball up, you know, and you just, you know, just have the exterior that's strong enough and you hold on to what you know you got and you believe in and you just push yourself through it, you know? And, um, you know, and a lot of other people feel like it's done for them. They're, they've lost their mind. They're going to go into a new field, whatever, whatever passion they had, they're going to throw to the side. And I, and I feel bad about that. I hope that they hear stories like, you know, what you just said, being honest. And they go, you know, I, you know, we could do this as long as your heart is in it. Yeah, and it's, you know, certainly 
it's it's been tough. I mean, you know, as a restaurateur, you hit there's a sweet spot when you own a restaurant. The first few years, you're not really making much money, right? You've got this debt service, and everyone looks at you and they go, "Oh, wow, uh, you know, look at your big, beautiful restaurant. You must be a millionaire. Look at all these people yeah. in here," <laughs> and they have no earthly idea of what the backstory is or the debt services or um, or any of that. Yeah. And we've been we've been fortunate for all of our restaurants. You know, Marketplace I've owned for about twelve years. Uh, Haymaker I've owned for three, and then Billy D's Fried Chicken three. So we've kind of got to the point where money was starting to come in. It was like, holy shit, we did it! Like you know, pat on the back. Like, yeah, all right, this is this it. is what's like. This is what's like to make money in the restaurant business. Um, <laughs> and then you know, slapped across the face with COVID. But I, you know, I do think it, it will bounce back. I really think that. Um, especially places like Asheville, you know, places like Las Vegas where people are like dying to get out. They may not want to jump on an airplane to go internationally, but they got to get the hell out of town and do something different rather than sitting in their house. We're going to be so fine. I think, yeah, we're going to be fine. Just, They're talking about a huge convention. They approved it for June, <clears throat> you know, it's the concrete, you know, and it's all the construction people it bring 60,000 people to Vegas. It's nice. going to be like Mardi Gras on the streets here. I swear. So, Hopefully for June, and I think it's a reality because you know, in, you know, like it, you know, people can get vaccines now at uh, uh, if you're six, sixteen and over as of April fifth in Las Vegas. So that's cool. Anyway, let's shift from that because yeah, um, I want to talk seafood with you, man. I, I, your passion, your connected, your connected uh, support of making sure that you know we keep the ocean in a, in a healthy enough situation that we can continue to great get great products in our kitchens to work with and. Of course, that makes us look good too if we handle it right. So, give me give me a little bit of an update on uh, where you're at with uh, you know going to the government. You know, <laughs> nothing more frustrating than what we were just going through as far as trying to get environmental um, um, approval. Through, you know, the past administration was not exactly environmentally friendly in my in my estimation. I'm really trying to sugarcoat the hell out of this. But they were now. Now we're in a new new era. New things are going on. You're inspiring the Blue Ribbon Task Force. These sixty chefs that have all been become the uh, recognized as in, in influencers and um, supporters of the same mentality. You know, we're all of the same. Uh, you know, we wish we we could have a better connection to. Uh, the sources, the stories behind them, and be able to make an assertion of who we should be more supportive of and how we can do it. But it gets confused by who distributes what, and all, it, and it's all about can I afford it? Can I afford that to put that in my restaurant with my price point? Because I'm not exactly in you know the metropolitan area where you can charge it uh, you know enough to make it all make sense. There's so 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 many things to consider. So snapshot, where are you at right now with all of this? Just out of curiosity. You know, at a current time, I mean, we're, you know, we're still pushing our menus to source as sustainably as possible. That That's just part of our DNA. Like that doesn't change ever. You know, we source local ingredients, we source sustainable seafood, and we try to do our best to make our community a better place. That's just like, just what you do because that's how you run a successful restaurant, okay, at least so. for my model. But for, you know, in terms of, of government stuff right now, I mean, you know, I think the government's so focused on everything going on in the world right now that, you know, a lot of the a lot of the policy issues around sustainable seafood probably won't come to a head until this fall or spring. It's kind of my my thought with it. I know there's certainly things happening on the back end, um, but right now, you know, I think we're everyone's trying to get us out of this, you know, get our heads up out of the sand and into into some more breathing air. I think I think you're wrong. I think you could do it sooner. If you put on your chef coat and you get up there and you speak in front of them, they are so sick of lobbyists. They want to, you know, throw up in their mouth. They go, oh, another lobbyist. They're scribbling on the paper, doing the crossword, going there. And when the chef gets up there, starts talking, they go, dinner, food. This is great. Yeah. Connect. They connect. And I'm and I've I've done it myself and you know, over different yeah. times. And it's 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 just a, it's just tremendous. You know, that well, uh, I think you you and I lobbied one time for Magnus and Stevens Act. On That's Capitol right, Hill. Magnus and Stevens yep. Act, exactly. Yeah, so I, you know, I, th I think there's forward progress. I think with new administration, people are, are now saying, okay, hey, we have the opportunity to kind of hit the reset button. Like you were mentioning, we were first getting started. Okay. And I think that's, that's kind of where I'm at is that, 
I don't want to start blasting people with with our storytelling and our our philosophy quite yet, you know, because I think people are inside the four walls of my restaurant, right? People just want good food right now and comfort right, food and right, right. to get out of just, the house. Yeah. But I always push my staff to teach them about why isn't what we do important? You know, it, we're farm to table restaurants, but you know, people still want seafood. So you know, no one's getting grouper from 10 miles away. It's coming from the coast three hours away. Uh, really that's, you know, as a, a little backstory, that's really what got me into sustainable seafood is that, I remember I live in Charleston, South Carolina, and let's say hypothetically, I call my fishmonger and said, I need 60 pounds of black grouper, and I would get two 30 pound fishing, right? Break them down, put them into service. Over the years, those two fish turned into four fish, turned into six fish, right? Smaller and smaller, and I'm calling my fishmonger and I'm saying, what's going on here? I, you know, a year ago, they, they were you know, 15 pound fish, now they're 10 pound fish consistently uh what's happening and you know like we talked about before about chefs being inquisitive and always wanting to learn new things and they said look you know overfishing right and that made me say well okay well maybe i don't need to have black grouper on my menu right now let's try something else and i started looking at seafood watch and learning about it and contacting them and doing some advocacy work and that led me uh to meet you i think i met you in 2010 you were being honored as a um, so you could watch Ambassador, or you, yeah, you yeah. got a big recognition. I got all the glass awards behind me. Those are, those are seafood watch things. They always give you a glass thing, you know. Pretty cool. Yeah, yeah I got a lot of uh, recognition from them. From, I was there from the end, onset with, with seafood, seafood choices. So um, during this pandemic, you know, our, our, the, you know the whole thing is, is powered by the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And um, it's Julia Packard, and you know they had to shut down the aquarium. So, so see, you know, see what became a uh, I mean, seafood watch. I'm so sorry, I'm, I used, I'm going further years back. Seafood watch became kind of like eh, it, it petered out, and 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 and, and, and we've been driving ourselves so long and finding connections and and success because the bigger that that. Blue Ribbon Task Force gets the, the the more messaging going out all over the country, not just in the area. It's it, you know that's the that's the idealistic dream of of growing that whole thing, and now the plug got pulled out on that, and it and it made us all feel kind of like eh, you know a little disappointed. And you you started the emails to all of the, all of the other guys saying we got to do something. You know, and you give a little report on what's happening, how you're getting hosed, you know, and you're, with your with your, uh, your business, and then you go on about brighter things, and 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 you know what? And, and it's getting to the point now where we're all going to get we're, we're going to get the band back together and the conversation in uh, in a uniform uh, messaging point so that impact can actually be realized. So I, first, I want to thank you for that, and I and I want to know how why you said I've had, had enough is enough. Where did the boiling point come where you had to get back and uh, get everybody back on track? You know, I started seeing a lot of other organizations that I had done a lot of work with over the years start to unravel, you know, big, big name foundations in our country in the culinary world that uh, push came to shove and the, the writing was on the wall about how they were actually operating and things started unraveling a little bit. And, you know, really I was just doing some soul searching about like what is important to me. Uh, we all, as chefs, we give so much. We, we do so many charity events. We do so many food and wine festivals. And I thought, you know, what's important now? Will I go back and do those events and guest chef dinners and food and wine festivals in the future? Sure, but I'm going to do them differently. And as I was looking at different organizations I, I worked with, I said, you know, Seafood Watch has been one of the most impactful ones that I've ever worked with in my career. One, they, they curated a group of people that are kindred spirits, but frankly, the 60 people you mentioned, the Blue Ribbon Task Force, I could grab their number out of my cell phone and call them pretty much any day and have an hour long conversation about something seafood or just a restaurant or, or even just ask them how they're doing. And they're, they're kind and you know, really great people. Um, and that's been a real big, real big imprint on my life and how I've kind of operate my restaurants, but also just, just 
using my voice as a chef and learning about how to get out and have these deep conversations about what's important and why for me is as I've curated my palate and my philosophies that seafood became extraordinarily important and to have a platform to go, like you mentioned to Capitol Hill and go sit down with the Senator that is, you know, typically got a blue suit lobbyist in there and they're thinking how long, right. But when they sit down and talk to you about how you cook at your restaurant, why these things are important, tell them the stories about the black grouper and about how things are being overfished and how the fishermen are, are feeling the pain about that. All of a sudden it's like something connects and you have this moment, this aha moment where like, oh my God, you just made change. That guy probably went and voted for the Madison Stevens Act. Yep. And it may, was that because of what you and I did? Maybe, maybe a little bit, but maybe it was the, what they need to push them over the edge to actually make the vote. Yeah. And that advocacy work, you know, I really, the, the torch that ignited that spark for me was, was through Seafood Watch when I got introduced to them, you know, a decade or more ago. Yeah, I remember and I'm, forever, I'm forever, forever grateful for the opportunity. Um, and also really for the people I've met along the way. Uh, it's been a really, a really interesting journey. I had a funny story. You know, I, I remember when I went in to see us, uh, Harry, Senator Harry Reid, you know, Senator Majority Leader at the time, and he's from the great state of Nevada and has a big connection with Las Vegas. And so I think it was the Ket Shares uh, program that we were trying to, like, um, you know, be more adopted around the, the, the different the fisheries around that surround our country because it was already being utilized in uh, you know the, the, the northwest of our country and it was, it was working very well you know it was it was probably the most sustainable fishery um, operating at the time and so i needed to get in to see harry reed well herman said wait one of my bartenders when i opened up my restaurant her dad knew Harry Reid from when he was a kid. They'd box together and they helped each other in, in the lower level of government. So I got I got in like that, no problem. So I'm sitting in the office and I'm ready to talk about catch shares. I have everything all memorized in my head, you know, rehearse it 17 times so I don't botch it up. You know, there's, a, there's the big goony guy, sta goon standing in the corner next to the baseball bat. And Harry's like, so how are you doing? He talked to me about Richie. Hey, Richie, how's Richie Vincent doing? Yeah, he's good. Yeah, he yeah. Thomas said hi and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, so he, he already knew I was there. So, so you know, you're here for the, that, that catch here. I said, yeah, I think we're, we really should hold on to it and support it. And he just turns to the goony guy and says, okay, let's make sure that happens. And, then, and, that, and that's the way it happens. Politics is about connectedness. People, people make decisions. It's not about screaming crowds and all that. Some sometimes it's it's about wearing the chef's coat and talking to the the individuals, and we, we don't we don't get accolades for this. We, we we recognize it for each other. We say good job, you did it. You know, I mean, I was lucky. I had a connection from the guy that wants us because I said, you know, that it, it really can. You know, it hurts the supply of what I can get in Las Vegas to serve the best of the best. And so he goes. That's what we want. Let's make sure that we change it. And, and, um, and you know, finding the right routes and collectively, when the when, as the the Blue Ribbon Task Force group grows, that the amazing group of like-minded people that are embedded all over, you know, uh, the the more that effect that we're going to be able to have. You know, and it's, you know, but there's there's an intersection between hospitality and diplomacy, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you got to you have to enlist both of those in day to day in a restaurant. Um, and I think, you know, I think chefs are, are good at that, right? We're good at talking to people. We're good at, at getting in front of a team of people and coaching them and telling them why something's important and what the story is behind it. And you apply that method to lobbying on Capitol Hill, right? Works well. And then you throw food into the game and it's like you just connect it with any human being on the planet. It's tough. Um, I think, yeah, it, it's, it, it's been an interesting journey, man. I, um, I love the opportunity to do that. That has been one of the most gratifying things I've had the chance to do is to go on Capitol Hill a number of times and, and advocate for things that I believe in. Uh, I've had people tell me, they say, you know, do you, do you want to get into politics? Do you want to do something like that? I said, I'm, not, I'm not really into politics. No. But I, like, I like policy. Yeah. I like policy because yeah, you can make yeah. change in policy. Yeah, don't do politics, please. It would be, it would yeah, be, a, waste, it would be a waste of great talent and that uh, we need your talent. You know, we need... You know, you speak through your food, you know, you, you get a wonderful restaurant, the marketplace. Tell me about your menu. And, and I know it's farm to table, but what's going on right now? I mean, how's business? First of all, I can, you know, is it coming back for you? Yeah, it's starting to, it's starting to rebound for sure. But we're in North Carolina, still only 50% capacity, uh, you know, limited, limited seating. 
everything's socially distanced, still tons of, you know, mask wearing, following the science, all, all that good stuff. Um, right. I'm hopeful though, like you mentioned by June, July, that, you know, the masks I think will be around for a while, which I'm fine with, but I, I think, I think hopefully by summer we'll be back at a hundred percent. I get think the people are going to, they're going to rip the top pe off, man. Pe people get to reveal themselves when they're sitting at a table. So they want to get in the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Although I'll tell you, man, the, the, the last year I've had to kick more people out of my restaurants and call the cops more times than, than the whole time I've been a restaurant tour and chef. People have just been crazy, man. Like, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't pass judgment on anyone in the past year here. It's been a, it's been a weird year, but the uh, man, people have really come out of their shell in the past year. It's wild. I don't know why they put that pressure on the hospitality environment. It's just the wrong place to do it. Yeah. Come on, play, follow the rules, play the games, and we'll all get out of it together. I mean, that's that's what I hope for, you know. Let's, let's do it. So let's talk fish. Let's talk fish. Let's talk real fish, you know. Um, I, I, want, I want your input on um, aquaculture. What do, what do you feel about aquaculture today? You know, I was not a big fan of it at first. I thought it's got to be wild fish. I want to know the fishermen that's caught it, where they're catching it, mm -hmm. how old's the fish, you know needs to be the freshest possible, only the best for my, my restaurant, my customers, mm -hmm. you know, and then I got introduced in Asheville to, um, you know, our mutual friend, Sally Eason with Sunburst oh, Trout. Trout. Yeah. Sunburst. Fantastic. And, uh, changed my mind. I grew up, I've been fly fishing since I was a kid in Appalachia and, mm -hmm. you know, it was something I do when I travel, take a fishing pole and try to you know, get out in the stream somewhere. But damn, when I first tasted Sunburst Trout, I was like, blew my mind. I was used to kind of muddy brown trout you found in the mountain streams. You know, it's all right, but earthy, oh, you know, she's muddy. Got a, she's got a natural aquifer on her property that just like completely supplies fresh, clean water to, oh, to grow beautiful. the trout. In. And the caviar is what blows my mind. Oh, the cold smoke caviar is insane. Oh, off the charts. But it changed, you know, it changed my perception. Um, and then, you know, things uh, recently, you know, I, I had done some work over the years with Verlasso. Um, you know, I, I, I like their salmon. I was a little interested in the kind of their feed setup and how they, how they're actually feeding their, their fish and what was in the feed. Um, and I've used some other farmed fish. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, shellfish, right? That's, well, that's the most sustainable. Uh, I, but I'd like to focus on thin fish. Yeah. Shellfish sure. is kind of an easy peasy squeezy subject. Re recently though, um, I got introduced to a company called Blue House Salmon. They're based in North Miami. Uh, and they are a farm. I heard, I heard about them. Farmed Atlantic salmon, man, and they're, it's the real deal. Um, Seafood Watch Best Choice, which, uh, how many best choice farmed salmons are there on the planet? I think a handful, Miami. three, four. I always think of, I think of a much colder northern waters when I think of salmon. I always forget about you know the California rivers, any rivers, you know, salmon are going to live in them. Yeah, I got to check um, it out. I, I visit. I did some work with the State Department and went to New Zealand and got to visit um, Mount Cook salmon mm -hmm. uh, over there. And then uh, what's the other big uh, New Zealand salmon company? Aura King. I got to visit those places. And those are spectacular. But this the Blue House salmon was pretty spot on, man. Um, it's a very new company, or at least new to the market. Um, and you know, I, I really I think they do a nice job. So I, you know, something I've been doing work with with the United Nations is about their SDGs and kind of the future of food. Certainly local, fresh, small farmers, you know, small fishermen. I think that's always going to be important for me. But I think if we start looking at food from a global perspective and how we're going to feed the world, right? Like you're going you to have to, to use farm stuff. Culture. Sure you have to. It's more than 50% yeah. of what we consume globally right now. And quite possibly it could go for higher up or could stay there. It doesn't matter. So it's, say it's 55. That might be what it is. So um, the, the sponsor of this, this podcast is Forever Oceans. And Forever Oceans is a startup aquaculture company that are doing things uh, quite right. You know, and I have, I've, I've educated myself over the years what that means. You know, I'm just saying, believe me, because I know, but right. uh, you, you, if you have a concern, they, they, they're considering it. 
and I'm I'm in, I'm involved uh, on a level where I can be the Trojan chef in the room, making sure saying, ah, "No, you can't do that. These guys, it's not going to work. It's not going to fly. Let's do. Got to think differently." And and let's start delivering species of fish that chefs are going to get excited about, not like oh, there's a hybrid this or something that that's you know this barramundi that if you cook it over two twelve seconds, it's not the same fish. It goes meh, you know something that in other words we can't really put in our restaurants because it's busy services and you need some leeway. It's you know some leeway, some fat, some texture that's going to maintain itself. Well, you know, you can assemble large parties in the middle of a crazy service. That's reality. So Forever Oceans is, um, you know, they're, they're, far, they're, you know, hatcheries on shore, farms for, far out into the ocean, pods controlled. You know, they can be hired and lowered depending on, you know, conditions. Is it Kampachi they're doing? They're, they're growing, it, right? Yeah, they're, yeah. It's, it, we call it, it the, the product is going to be called Kahala. Kahala. It's, it's the Amberjack family. Yes, exactly. And, nice. um, I'll make sure you get a couple samples to try. I would like to get your feedback on it. You know, video yourself opening the box and saying, okay, Moon and sent me a box and I open it up. Have somebody, can, you know, and have fun with it. Can re create recipes for it. We're trying to, because, you know, it's a really good quality product. I mean, a, a, a little while ago, I got to go out to West Virginia, you know, where, you know, I, I, I worked on a, ser a lot of these fish, you know, just cut them, broke them down, did them in different um, cooking methods from, you know, raw to grilled to seared to poached to whatever. You know. got to hang, hang out with my buddy, Mark Allison. Uh, that's, yes, Mark and I got yeah. to work together. So Mark yeah, is, yeah. is there, uh, he's, a, he's the chef. He created these recipes and then we worked together on, you know, doing not too much. Then I then I changed them. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell him. He can't help myself. Oh, he'll laugh. And um, yeah, he's he's a, he's a tremendous guy to work with. And but really, to be able to put your hands on these these kahala and fillet them and feel the texture, it was, it was exciting. It, it's it, I like it when it's exciting when you get an aquaculture product, you know. And you want to know well the first thing you think if it's this good, are they doing things right? And yeah, guess what? They are super cool they're worried about the texture they're 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 concerned about the nutrition and the value of it so if you know when it goes into the science lab and they put it through the the, the, you know, the micro testers they've got and they find out that holy smokes it's got two two percent less uh you know body fat than the, you know, the wild whatever but the wilds do not doing well so whatever it may be they may actually we're gonna i think we're gonna perform higher because we did a blind test against a lot of the you know competing things in the category and it's keep it spot so and then and then to think about the next thing being a being grouper you know because you know we know that black grouper you know problematic here and you can't buy it anymore well maybe this start farming black grouper and and and, it, and the, it's, the research is into it already the, the startup company's got 13 years of the owners you know drive towards this doing it and, and he's, he's heard all the discussions and understands the importance of putting it together and producing a product that has got flavor nutrition texture you know because you know a lot of times it's beautiful fish but it doesn't have the excitement for a chef you know so you know grouper and and uh, you know red snapper and you know and hopefully but you know maybe cobia i happen to be in nice. i fell in love with cobia and there's a, I don't know, in West Virginia, there was a, a cobia farm, I remember, and I remember visiting to it. I don't know if you were ever, if that was ever on your radar, but it was pretty cool. So that's Forever Oceans, you know, and I, and I want to make, I want to put it in your hands. I would like to have your honest uh, feedback about it. Please. Yeah, I said, I'd love to try it. I mean, one, the one great thing about farmed aquaculture seafood is that, you know, we look for in restaurants, rice consistency. You know, if you can get a fish that is consistently the same sizing, same great flavor, same texture, right? You know, if you put on the menu for a month or two months, this when the guests come in, they're going to say, "Wow, that I want that, I want that cobia, I want that salmon," um, and you know that you've got a, a good product to stand behind. And I think that's something that you know we all look for as restaurateurs and chefs is that you want that consistency because that's how you that's how you keep your restaurant open and keep people coming back in. Right. You know, if the food is great one week and then it sucks the next, you know, that's your reputation. You, you can't, you can't be all over the, you can't be all over the place. Eh, hey, tonight's a crapshoot. We'll see how we're feeling. Come on in. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't, that, that, the business model doesn't work in every, every, every sector of our, uh, our industry. <laughs> so, um, 
Uh, tell me, so, you know, when you're not working, tell me about what you're up to. You, are you a cyclist or so? How do you stay in such great shape? And, uh, you know, I've got two little kids that keep me running. Yeah. Um, I, you know, pre-COVID, I was in the gym four, six days a week. Um, I've got a little home gym now that I try to work out in, but usually get interrupted by my son at six o'clock in the morning. He wakes up usually <laughs> around the same time I do. Um, but, I, you know, I try, body in motion stays in motion. So I, um, you know, try to get a good exercise routine. You know, people think being a chef around food, you don't always eat the best all the time. You know, when you're sitting down on a milk crate uh, before dinner service, yeah. scarfing a bowl of something in your mouth, um, you know, drinking beer after service is probably not the healthiest. Mashed potatoes I, for dinner, you know. <laughs> yeah, but I certainly, I try to eat well and, um, you know, take care of myself. Um, there's definitely a lot of other things I enjoy in life. You know, I, I enjoy a drink or two every now and again and, you gotta have you gotta have balance. So, what do you into? Um, is it whiskey? You like whiskey? I like bourbon, man. Bourbon yep. is a bourbon. Yeah, right I enjoy beer. Well, Asheville is beer city, USA. But uh, you know, if you're gonna drink, you might as well get the job done. I gotta send a bottle of my Russells. I bought a barrel of it. I when I shut oh, my nice. restaurants down, I you know I stored them and I have them. I like to send them to friends. I really love. Really can appreciate it. So, yeah, Russells Reserve. So, Eddie, nice. Eddie Russell, he does, he does uh, you know turkey, wild turkey one on one. Which is terrific. Bird, I've got some bird. friends in, in West Virginia. Actually, they have a distillery called Smooth Ambler, um, we'll and they uh, a few years ago they won Best Bourbon in the World. And a year later, they got bought out by Pernod Ricard. Um, so you're saying they, you're saying if I want one of those bottles, I got to give you two bottles of Russell's Reserve. That's what I'm hearing. Oh, I think it was probably a fair trade at this point. All right, cool. <laughs> but yeah, man, no, I, you know, I'd, we just try to get out. Living in the mountains, like part of the reason we moved there is. When you live in a city, it's like you want to get away from the people. I mean, I'm at my restaurant, Charlotte, right now, looking out at, you know, 60-story skyscrapers. And yeah. when you're around that all the time, it gets old. You know, you need to change the scenery. You need some greenery. You need some... Yeah. Breathe. Um, breathe. Yeah, you need yeah. to breathe. And in Asheville, you know, you go... It's a bustling little tourist city, but you go 30 minutes in any direction, and you're in a state or national park somewhere. And it's mm -hmm. yeah, there's room to breathe and room to move. That's, that's, nice, actually, but, that's actually even true of Vegas. It doesn't take long to get out to be a, a Red Rock or to a Mount Charleston or, you know, Valley of Fire or, you know, the Grand Canyon. You know, we've got a lot. There's a lot here. I, I love living in Vegas. You know, I wouldn't trade it for the world. For, but, you know, but I like, but I miss the water. So I I got to, I got to either take a couple of months when it's like 110 degrees in Vegas and find a place in like Vancouver or something on the water. Yeah, man. I, I lived in Santa Barbara for a little while too. That's a nice place, which is probably, you know pretty close to where, relatively close to where you are. What five hours? Yeah, Six it's hours. not that bad. Yeah, we'd throw the dogs in there. It's good to have, be able to, you know, because I have two border collies that, you know, they gotta they they're very active and they're very engaged, so they have to come with you. They've they've seen the world already practically. Nice. My wife likes to drive. Sometimes I'm going. Oh, I can't handle that long. I'll fly. I'll meet you out there. <laughs> <laughs> I get something really important to do the day I have to leave, but I can meet you uh, tomorrow. <laughs> uh, sometimes, sometimes it's better that way. <laughs> yeah, I do a bit of traveling right now, so I got bold shots. I'm good to go, man. You are William. I I considered you a friend from the second I met you. I really did, you know. And I, I remember where I was. I think it was in Washington or somewhere. We we all we had dinners together. It was a man. It was a tapas restaurant. It was a wooden, wooden tables and we were hanging out. And I remember, you know, just talking to you about absolutely everything. And you're just a real easy going, smart, caring uh, man with a purpose. Like I said in the beginning, when I introduced you. I think you. that was, a, that may have been after the catch share. Who was with us? Uh, I think Andrea Rusing, maybe? Yes, exactly. She yeah. certainly was. Also from yeah. Nashville, right? I haven't, uh, she's from Chapel Hill. Chapel Hill. Right Raleigh. Yeah. yeah. She's a piece of cake too. A piece of work. I love talking to her. I got, I got some places to visit, some friends to, to uh, support and um, reconnect. Yeah, when your son gets out to Winston, let me know, man. Well, uh, I'm, I'm always on the go across the state, so That's happy great. to come meet up with you or have you come into one of our restaurants to come check it out. Yeah, his wife's attending a college out there for a couple of years, so he's, uh, he doesn't know. You never know. He'll fall in love with it and stay there or whatever, but while he's there, I'm going to go definitely go and say hi. So um, I'll definitely let you know that 100%. 
So um, uh, thank you, and, and thank all the listeners of uh, the, our podcast, Ocean Raised. This is Chef Rick Moonen and William Disson. Um, um, I'm going to keep in touch, all right? Let's uh, love you to death. Yeah, man, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to see you, and uh, look forward to seeing you in person soon, man. Take care. Okay, thanks, Rick. ForeverOceans.com.